I'm an infectious disease division, and I actually had friends at the Wuhan Institute, and I called them up and asked them what's going on. And they said, there's a new pneumonia going around, and it's worse than what the Chinese government is saying. I just came home for my husband's birthday in March 13th. We arrived to the airport, it was empty, because that night the U.S. was closed down. We all remember the moment the COVID-19 pandemic became real for us. It came out of nowhere, followed by dire headlines, lockdowns, a global health tragedy unfolding on scales unseen in over a century, and a breakthrough that seemed to appear the very moment it was needed. But for biochemist Catalin Carrico and infectious disease expert Drew Weissman, it had taken 25 years of bioengineering. I had a full head of hair when I started, <laughs> so. No, that's not true. <laughs> Before the spotlight fell on mRNA vaccines. In 1996, Weissman joined the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Medicine, where Carrico had worked for 10 years. By then, she'd moved on, switched departments. Their paths might not have crossed at all. Maybe I must keep coming back because I know the password for the Xerox yeah. machine, something like that. <laughs> it was while making photocopies that Carrico learned Weissman was searching for an HIV vaccine. She just happened to be an expert in the very stuff he wanted to use, mRNA. Typical vaccines work by showing the immune system a protein fragment of a virus, like the spike protein you may have seen in the news. The immune system analyzes the fragment and mounts a defense. But to make a vaccine with traditional methods, researchers have to learn the protein's shape and then manufacture it. This takes time, and viruses like HIV mutate too fast. mRNA is like a courier service to the protein factories in the body. Use mRNA to deliver the blueprints of a virus's protein signature, the pair figured, and the cells in the body would do the manufacturing for them. So we are not created a new drug, we just uh, borrowed from nature. But nature is complex. Millions of years of evolution made mRNA resistant to the changes Carrico and Weissman needed to make if they were ever to coax it into delivering the protein blueprints they needed. Their attempts were causing dangerous inflammation. The cause lay hidden somewhere within the intricate interplay between the molecules that make up mRNA and a multitude of cellular sensors that trigger the immune system. The obstacles meant virtually no one supported their work but the pair persisted. Every new finding led to hundreds of more questions. By 2014, a series of breakthroughs answered the last of those questions. They'd found the inflammation-causing receptors and learned how to circumvent them. After years of probing the infinite complexity of the immune system, an mRNA vaccine platform that was safe and with incredible potential. It's almost unimaginable how many different vaccines can potentially be made. The evening before the paper came out, I said to Katie, tomorrow our phones are gonna ring off the hook. This was science that could possibly pave the way for vaccines against deadly allergies, cancers, and countless viruses. Vaccines that could be deployed quicker than ever. And the next day, the phone didn't ring. The next week, the next month, the next year. What should we do now? They decided to press on studying how mRNA could be developed as therapeutics for many types of diseases. And suddenly, the phone did ring, and it rang in a big way. We hadn't been subjected to a pandemic in 100 years. There was an announcement that there is a new virus coming out in, from Wuhan and other places. Hospitals were being prepared in China that could handle thousands of patients. With a global pandemic imminent, it became clear that the task of saving millions of lives would fall to drug makers. I literally woke up in sweat one morning, and I'm like, oh, geez, it's a pandemic like 1918. And I totally changed my plan. I was supposed to go to Germany after Switzerland, and I bought a one-way ticket to Washington, D.C. to go meet with Dr. Fauci to go to the FDA. CEOs Albert Borla of Pfizer, Alex Gorsky of Johnson & Johnson, and Stefan Bonsell of Moderna found themselves answering a desperate call, a safe vaccine produced more quickly and in greater quantities than any before. Every day is going to matter because a lot of people are going to die. This was a must-not-fail moment. January 2020. Drug makers and U.S. health agencies held emergency meetings in Washington. Discussions about a potential vaccine were two-pronged. It needed to be safe and effective, and it needed to come fast. 
These kind of development programs can ordinarily take between seven and 17 years. In fact, until then, the fastest vaccine development in history concluded in 1967, with a vaccine for mumps taking just four years. But with COVID-19 mortality projections forecasting millions of deaths annually, the world couldn't afford to wait. In a twist of good fortune, some groundwork had been laid in recent years. For nearly a decade, Johnson & Johnson scientists had been working on an adenovirus-based platform in their efforts to develop vaccines for other infectious diseases like Ebola. And in 2016, Franklin Institute laureate Kizmikia Corbett and her team at the NIH had learned how to make stable coronavirus spike proteins, fast-tracking the procurement of the virus fingerprint. And Caraco and Weissman's mRNA delivery platform had recently undergone two years of experimental testing, allowing Pfizer and Moderna to move forward with a solution that would cut manufacturing time. On March 16, we injected the first human being with the vaccine. In fewer than 100 days, clinical trials began, along with the nail-biting wait for results. In the meantime, Gorski, Borla, and Boncel faced a second formidable challenge. There were things that were going to keep you awake at night. One, there was the fundamental question of, could we have the chemistry, the biology, that was going to show this vaccine to be safe and effective? Number two, could we produce it at scale? Do we have the engineering capacity? For all three drug makers, the answer was a resounding no. The manufacturing infrastructure simply didn't exist anywhere worldwide. In 2019, we had made for the entire year, for all the products, less than $100,000. The peak production that we had on an annual basis before the pandemic was 200 million doses across all our vaccines, across all our manufacturing sites in the world. Consider the flu vaccine. The total number of doses produced yearly worldwide by all manufacturers hovers at around 500 million doses. I discussed with my head of manufacturing and I said, Juan, we need to make a billion doses next year. Three billion doses within the first year while there were no manufacturing facilities ready to do something like that. But by March, an unprecedented collaboration of scientists, regulators, and logistics and distribution experts supported by private and public funding had come together to do the impossible. These people are mothers and fathers, their brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts, who poured their heart and soul working 24-7 for months they believe that what's at stake is not their career, is not the success of the company, it is the safety, it is the survival of people that they love. Meanwhile, ventilator shortages, heartbreaking farewells by cell phone, friends separated, families driven apart by the wedge of isolation, a rising death toll. The world was watching literally every step uh, that was being taken. And collectively holding its breath waiting for the results of the first clinical trials thanks to tens of thousands of volunteers. For Moderna, that call came in November. The vaccine was 94% efficacious. What I remember, it was on a Sunday. I literally left my home office when I heard it. I went to my wife and I started crying in her arms. By early December, Pfizer was the first to receive emergency authorization from the FDA. Don't ever think something is impossible before you try. You will be surprised. By February 2021, all three companies had the FDA green light to move forward with vaccinations. The sweeping effort to invent manufacturing infrastructure had also succeeded. Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson began the largest vaccine distribution effort in history. You had the trucks loading at the CDC and getting to get the vaccine distributed in the US. Seeing those actual containers being shipped from our warehouses and being right here in New Jersey with the governor, seeing the first shots being administered in patients' arms were all moments that I'll never forget. I still remember the day that the 92 years old women in UK dressed in festive holiday clothes received the first vaccine in the world for COVID, that was our vaccine. And on her way out in a wheelchair, the personnel of the hospital were giving her a standing ovation. And after a year of lockdowns and heartbreak, hope. In the other room, they already injected the vaccine to the healthcare workers, and that was very emotional. And then we were sitting with Drew waiting for the injection. And I was just thinking about all of the work we have done together. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was 25 years of work being stuck in my arm. It was a fantastic feeling. The record-setting vaccine response by the three U.S. drug makers and others is helping to protect people around the globe 
4.4 billion and counting from death and serious disease, paving the way for schools and businesses to open, for protecting healthcare workers at the front line, and for families, friends, and communities to finally come together again.